If you'll take your Bibles now and turn to the book of Jonah. We're going to start reading in just a moment at the end of Jonah chapter 3, and we'll read the entirety of chapter 4. It's just a few verses. Uh, but as you're turning there, uh, I want to give you a little bit of historical background, which really adds to the understanding of this book. Uh, in the declining years of the northern kingdom of Israel, so you had the, the United Kingdom under, uh, under uh, Saul and David and Solomon uh, around the year 1000 B.C., uh, and uh, in the so, and then there was a split uh, after Solomon uh, after Solomon died, and 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 so you got the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom of Judah. Uh, so the Northern Kingdom lasted for uh, you know close to three hundred years, bless you. And so uh, in the declining years of the Northern Kingdom, this would be about seventy five years before the nation of Assyria destroyed the Northern Kingdom in seven twenty two B C. So about 75 years before that, God called the prophet Jonah to go to the capital of Assyria, which was Nineveh, and to preach its destruction and to call out for its repentance. So Nineveh was a godless city in a godless nation, and they were no friends of Israel. Uh, however, at this time, there was unrest in the Assyrian Empire. Uh, which was the, the whole empire, the Assyrian Empire, was involved in two major wars, neither of which Israel was involved in. And so, uh, so perhaps Nineveh would, would be willing to listen to the preaching of Jonah at this time. You know, there's nothing like war or disease to make people, wise people, consider their own mortality and hopefully listen uh, to the preaching of, of God, uh, to the preaching of the truth. But as we'll see, Jonah's heart was not in step with the heart of this merciful God who sent him to Nineveh. So as we come to chapter 4, uh, and we've been doing, we've been in Jonah and devotions this week, but here's what's happened so far in a nutshell. Uh, God commanded Jonah to go and cry out against Nineveh because in, in chapter 1, verse 2, it says, because their evil has come up before me. Instead, Jonah goes the opposite direction. So God says, go to Nineveh. Jonah instead goes, to, goes the opposite direction uh, and, uh, and he's going to what's modern-day Spain. So Nineveh, if you, could, if you can picture the Mediterranean Sea, and then go 500 miles uh, pretty much to the east, that's where Nineveh was. Spain is 3,000 miles from, you know, Joppa was 3,000 miles, or Tarshish was 3,000 miles from uh, Nineveh. So Jonah goes the opposite direction, taking a ship to Tarshish, uh, which, which again is modern-day Spain. And it says that he did this, quote, to flee from the presence of the Lord. So God showed Jonah uh, next as he's on the boat. He shows Jonah that there's nowhere that he can flee from his presence, as David says uh, in the psalm. Where can I flee from your presence? Well, Jonah, uh, Jonah finds this out in a very uh, inconvenient way. Because God, it says, hurls a great storm upon the sea. And the sailors begin to ask, why is this happening? And uh, when they realize that it's because of Jonah, they throw him overboard. They reluctantly throw him overboard, and the storm ceases. A big contrast to the way that Jesus calmed the sea, by the way. Next, Jonah is swallowed by a huge fish. The Hebrew for this is dag gadol. And uh, dag is just the word for fish. It's where we get the word dagon or dagon. Uh, the fish god of Philistia, but dag just means fish, gadol means great, uh, so it was a great fish or a big fish. Uh, the, the idea that it was a whale came along a lot later, uh, even the King James and the, and the Geneva Bible translated as great fish, as they should, or big fish, uh, as they should. But uh, I'm not quite sure where the idea of a whale came from, but, but in any case, it was just a big fish, we don't know what kind. But uh, having watched uh, lots of uh, several uh, episodes of the, the uh, Our Planet Nature series about the great deep, about the sea, there are some big fish out there, perfectly capable of swallowing a person. And uh, in the Mediterranean, there is a there is a fish just like this that is uh, that is plenty big enough. So it may have been that kind of fish. We're not sure. But anyway, for three days and three nights, he's in the fish. And this is, a very, this is to be taken very literally. Jesus uh, uh, refers to this. So 
you can't survive in a fish unless one of two unless something happens unless you're miraculously kept alive in a very uncomfortable environment and Jonah prays a prayer talking about the seaweed covering his head and so forth or unless Jonah died and was resurrected in the belly of the fish which is also a possibility the text does not does not tell us but in any case at the end of three days he is vomited up on the land now he's he's not vomited up on the shores of Nineveh which is what many people for many people think the text doesn't say that it says it simply says that he was vomited up on the land at the end of chapter 2 verse 10 the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up upon the dry land so this would be on the shores of the Med on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea somewhere we don't know where we're not told where but from that point he would have to go at least 500 miles on foot to Nineveh so so you know when you read this book uh, it might seem like everything happens really quickly but it's it actually happens over a prolonged period of time this this should give Jonah plenty of time to think about things but unfortunately, we're going to see that it does not. Uh, Jonah is still obstinate. He's still stubborn, as we'll, as we'll get there. But, it's, but we also don't know how far the ship was heading towards Spain we don't, before the storm happened. It may have happened right away. It may have happened days into the journey. We don't, we don't really know. Uh, but it's very likely that the fish took Jonah back the other direction. And in any case, when we find Jonah at the beginning of chapter uh, uh, 3 on the dry land, God says to him the same thing that he said at the beginning. Arise and go to Nineveh. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So we see that no matter what Jonah's done, uh, no matter what he's been through, the word of the Lord stands. God does not change his message based on our desires or based even on our shall we say, antics. So Jonah walks the rest of the way to Nineveh, and then he gets to Nineveh, and Nineveh was a big city at this time. The text tells us that it would take three days just to walk through the city. So if you can think about uh, you know, some modern cities that are that, are that big or bigger. Uh, so Jonah walks an entire day's journey into the city before he begins to preach. And then he preaches a message of judgment uh, with no hope. He just, he just says God is going to destroy the city, and yet the people repent and believe God. And they even repent in dust and ashes, as you'll see in just a second. And so you would think that this would make Jonah happy, but instead he has a very different reaction. He's very angry, he's very upset that the people listen to his preaching. As a preacher, there's nothing better than when people listen and apply it. That's just... That just really makes us happy, or it should, but not so with Jonah. Hear the word of the Lord, John chapter 3, verse 6, and we'll go through the end of chapter 4. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way... God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, or literally it was exceedingly evil to Jonah, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant, or a gourd, and made it come up over Jonah, 
that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, and so it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, now make us willing to listen and to learn and to rejoice and to grow, all because of your Spirit's blessing upon your holy word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is uh, an interesting chapter, to be sure. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the first thing I want to look at is Jonah's reaction in, in chapter 4, verse 1. And, uh, and I want to make the point that, that a preacher can preach without his heart being affected by the word that he preaches. So Jonah is preaching, but his heart is not in tune with God's heart. You can see uh, at the beginning that, that this, this, it says, it was, a, was exceedingly evil to Jonah. It's literally, in, in Hebrew, it's structured like this. It says, it was evil to Jonah, a great evil. So the, so the word evil is repeated uh, for emphasis, and it's it's sort of uh, uh, magnified by the word great, the same adjective that describes the fish. It was a it was evil to Jonah, a great evil. So, what exactly was it that was a great evil to Jonah? What was he so upset about? And the answer is God's mercy. God's mercy is what made Jonah so angry. So, what Jonah wanted to do is he wanted to preach, and then watch them burn. He wanted to preach and then watch the city be destroyed. That's what he wanted. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes I see, I, and you've probably seen street preachers that, that preach in such a way with such a tone that it's like they want people uh, to perish. It's like they're glad that people are going to hell instead of taking a pleading tone or taking a, a tone of, you know, holding out the mercy of God to them. You know, jo Jonah doesn't even preach anything uh, with mercy. He just... Uh, he, he doesn't say what he knows is true. And you can see that Jonah knows uh, that God is merciful. But he doesn't tell the Ninevites that. He just preaches a message of doom. He just says, he just says yet 40 days the Nineveh will be overturned. And that's all he says that we know of in, in uh, chapter 3, verse 4. And he wants them to be destroyed. And so we can see right away that Jonah's attitude was diametrically opposed to the attitude of God. You know, uh, the Bible tells us that there's rejoicing in heaven, right? In Luke 15, there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. So think about a whole city repenting. Th this causes rejoicing in heaven while Jonah is pouting. You know, God uh, is delighting in mercy and Jonah is delighting in destruction. And he's reluctant to see forgiveness take place. He even tells God, I told you so, in verse 2. He's, he's, uh, uh, he, he begrudges God's mercy. Look at verse 2. He says, he prays to the Lord and he says, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my own country? So he's basically telling God that this whole thing was a big waste of time. The, 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 uh, the, the time in the fish, the, the journey on the land to Nineveh, the preaching, the going through the city, it was a big waste of time. He says, he's saying, God... I knew you'd be merciful. You know, if you were going to show mercy, why didn't you just do it while I was still at home? Before you called me to leave the safety of Israel and go to this pagan place with these people that I can't stand. Why didn't you just show mercy to them without wasting my time? That's basically what he's praying. And then to make matters worse, he justifies his sin. He says, he says, 
This or that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you're a gracious God. So he's, he's, he is justifying turning away from God. He's justifying rebelling against God because, because he says, I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And then in verse 3, we can see that Jonah would rather die then see God have mercy on people that he feels have wronged him. So this is definitely a commentary on how dark the human heart can be, even the religious human heart. Even a prophet of God uh, can preach the words and not get it, and not let it sink down into his, into his heart. And so when Jonah preaches, he's still hoping that God will destroy the city. That's why he goes out of the city and watches. And he's watching to see if God will destroy the city. And so we can see here that God, that, that a man can know the character of God and yet detest the character of God. Look at the description that Jonah uses of the character of God. Uh, it's, really, it's really a beautiful description. It's one of the most beautiful descriptions in Scripture of the character of God. He says, For I knew, and now Jonah's saying this in context, he's throwing it in God's face. But it is a true description of God's character. I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. So the first thing he says about God is that God is gracious. This is a word that is only used of God in the scriptures. Only used to describe God in the scriptures. It's a way that God describes himself. In Exodus chapter 34 verse 6, uh, it says, The Lord passed before him and, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will know, by no means clear the guilty. So God, when he proclaims his own name, describes himself as gracious. That is part of his character. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17, it says, They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return them to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. So we can see that Israel needed this graciousness, didn't they? They were stiff-necked, just like the Ninevites. And yet God was gracious. God was gracious and merciful. Uh, in Nehemiah 9, 31. Nevertheless, for your great mercy's sake, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Psalm 86, 15. It says, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Can I just say that I'm glad he's slow to anger? I'm glad. I'm glad he's slow to anger. I'm glad that he is gracious. So when I read these things, it makes my heart rejoice. Uh, Psalm 111, verse 4. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Psalm 145, 8. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Joel chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over the disaster. Same thing that Jonah said. Same thing that Jonah knew. And so what do you do when you come to know your sin? What is it that brings you the most hope and brings you peace and joy. It's knowing this gracious character of God. It's knowing that if you will turn to God, He is willing to forgive you. He is ready to forgive. He is abundantly gracious. He's not just a little bit gracious, but abundantly gracious. So that's, that, that's how Jonah describes him. He's gracious. 
The next thing he says is that he's merciful. I know you're a, a God, a gracious God and merciful. Asher, come sit on the front row, son. Since we got here, you have not stopped touching your mother and talking to her. So sit there, okay? And pay attention. This is important stuff. Then go. Merciful and compassionate. I mean, it just went before the service started. All right. So merciful and compassionate, as you, and you notice the mercy and compassion of God uh, was was all through those verses uh, that we just read. Joel two thirteen. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful. So gracious has to do with a favorable disposition, right, towards towards God's people. Mercy has to do with forgiving rather than punishing their sin. We need the grace and the mercy of God. What about slow to anger? Uh, slow to anger. God is slow to anger. Nahum verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, but the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. So, so God is patient with us. He's patient with us. Uh, Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But... He will by no means clear the guilty. Now, if, if we know that we're guilty, then we can't just be cleared from our guilt. God has to punish our sin. The gospel is that he's punished our sin in Christ. And so he can be merciful to us. But if God dealt with us strictly according to what our sins call for, he would have slain us all and sent us all to hell long ago. But he is slow to anger. Now, the Bible calls us to be uh, slow to anger. You know, uh, there's not a, there's not a, there's a description of God throughout the Bible that says he's slow to anger. There's not a description of a man that says, you know, this man was slow to anger. <clears throat> I was thinking that probably the closest would be David. You know, David, when he is, uh, when Absalom leads the rebellion against David and David has to leave Jerusalem, flee Jerusalem for his life. And then there's this guy, Shimei, who is cursing David and, call, and uh, yeah, cursing him publicly. David's mighty men say, let us go over there and take his head off for cursing the king. And David, and David says, no, leave him alone. Maybe God has bidden him to throw stones at me. That's patience right there. After, after all that David went through, and, uh, and yet in the midst of his anguish and turmoil, he is slow to anger towards this man. And as the king, he could have rightly said, go ahead, guys, go take care of it. But he's slow to anger. But we're all called to be this way. All of us are called to be slow to anger. Uh, you know, in James chapter uh, chapter 2, verse 19, as, as we read, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of of God. It's the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So God is, com is, is called gracious, compassionate, or merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in covenant love, or hesed. Uh, you know, a, a beautiful uh, Hebrew word. Uh, he is abounding in this. He's abounding in this covenant love. Every time we hold up the communion cup and say this cup is the new covenant in Christ's blood, we are talking about uh, the abundance of God's covenant love. God's covenant love is so great, again, that he sent his son to ratify the covenant in his blood. To suffer uh, under the, the scorn and, and cruelty of men to die for us. And then it says that God relents over evil or disaster. The, the word is literally evil, but it uh, is usually translated as disaster. Um, so so in, in chapter 3, verse 9, it says uh, the, the king of Nineveh, this is his hope, but he doesn't have a word from God. He, he, he only hears the word of Jonah, which is Nineveh is going to be destroyed. But then look at what he says. He says, who knows... Chapter 3, verse 9. God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. In verse 10, it says, 
when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of disaster that he of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So this idea that God will relent from disaster is the hope of the Ninevite king. He hopes that God might be this way, but see, he doesn't know the character of God. Jonah knows the character of God and despises it. The king hopes that this is the character of God, and if it is, he'll, he, he will delight in it. It will be salvation and life to him and all his people. But Jonah knows it and hates it. So you see the contrast uh, and I hope you're starting to see a theme here that Jonah was the biggest problem in the entire book. He's a bigger problem, even though he's a prophet of God, than the pagan Ninevites are. Because he knows God's character, but he hates it. He hates God's character. And maybe this is because when Je of what Jesus says in Luke chapter 7 verse 47 when he says he that has been forgiven little loves little he that has been forgiven little loves little he that has been forgiven much loves much and he says this he's speaking of a woman who is weeping over his over him and washing his feet uh, with her with her tears and uh, and it's a scandal of people that are standing around. You know, why, why, why is there such a display here? And the answer is because if you understand how much you've been forgiven, you will love God so much that you won't really care what anybody else thinks about your expressions of love to God. But on the contrary, if you don't think you need a lot of forgiveness, that will directly impact the amount of love that you have towards God. So interestingly, the path one path to loving God more is to understand how much He's forgiven you. And you can only know that by knowing His Word, knowing His righteous standard, and through prayer. But somehow Jonah doesn't get this. Uh, you know, and, and so Jonah, of all the characters in Scripture, Jonah is the only one that uses the goodness of and graciousness of God as a reason to disobey God. He's the only one. He says, I knew that you were a good God. I knew that you were a merciful God. I knew that you were a gracious God. Therefore, I disobey. It is just, it really shows how warped we can become if we're not in the, in the Word and if we're not meditating on the graciousness of God. And if Jonah could just have seen himself and his need in the Ninevites, if he just knew that all people have a sin nature, we all sin, and we all need the grace of God, then he would have rejoiced rather than rebelled. He would have rejoiced in the character of God because he, because he would have known that God's mercy was his only hope. God's patience was his only hope. Look how patient God is with Jonah. I mean, he, he's patient. God says, God, the maker of heaven and earth, tells Jonah to do one thing. He does the exact opposite because he thinks he's going to run from the presence of God. And so, you know, you, you know, I've heard people despise God's forgiveness before towards those people, right? And whoever those people are, you know, you know, they, they can be Muslims, they can be... Uh, murderers, they can be the worst criminals in the world. But I've heard people say, you know, I don't think that's right that they can live this horrible life and then at the end of their life or after committing major sins, they repent and God just forgives them. I don't think it's right that he would do that. That's pretty much what Jonah was saying. The Assyrians were wicked. They were a wicked, godless, evil people. They, they, they rejoiced in sin. Uh, they despised the true God. They did horrendous things. Things that can't even be repeated uh, right now. But God chose to have mercy on them. And that's a display of His gracious, merciful heart. And so... Again, the more we know ourself and our own need, the more willing we are to rejoice in God's forgiveness to the worst of sinners.
right? Paul called himself the chief of sinners, always to keep himself, guard himself in this attitude that God shouldn't forgive those other people. The Pharisees fell into this same idea, the same standoffish, you know, they, at the beginning of Luke 15, the text that contains the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son, or the two sons, the whole context is set up, as you remember, by the Pharisees being offended that sinners would come to Jesus, that Jesus would welcome them into his presence. Now, Jesus didn't welcome them and approve of their sin. He welcomed them and called them to turn from their sin. Night and day difference. Jesus was always saying repent. You know, I see these things that says, well, Jesus welcomes everybody. Yes, he does. He welcomes everybody to turn from their sin. He doesn't welcome everybody and approve of their sin. That is not the biblical Jesus. That is, a, that is an idol. It is a false Jesus. Another, it's, it's another Jesus, as the Bible warns us to be aware that people are going to create other Jesus in their own image. But the true Jesus would go into uh, a crowd of sinners, if you, were, if you will, and he would tell them about the mercy and love of God and also warn them about the wrath and severity of God. But the Pharisees wanted to stand back and never talk to anybody who's in sin. They wanted to stand back and watch them burn. They wanted to stand back and just know that God is going to destroy those people. But not me. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. That was the Pharisaical prayer. But God's heart is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and plead with people. Plead with people to turn from their sin. Whether they listen to you or not, whether they despise you or not, whether they reject you or not, whether they try to change the message or not, plead with them to turn from their sin. Tell them about the love of God. Tell them about the gracious, merciful, forgiving character of God. There is grace and, and, and mercy for sin. And, and to, to, to not be delighted that people would listen to that message. Is to, not, is to be in direct rebellion to the word of God and to be worse than those who reject God. Jonah dares to say this as well in, in chapter 2. He says, Was not this my word that I said when I was yet in my country? So the emphasis is on his word as opposed to the word of God. The first person to ever do that uh, was uh, was uh, Satan in the garden to substitute his word for the word of God. So Jonah falls right in line there. Um, and he's in direct contradiction to the word of God. And then in verse 3, as you saw, our own bitterness can turn the very character of God into a cause to die. He says, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Uh, Jonah hates the Assyrians so much that he, and he can't stand the idea of worshiping next to them. He doesn't want to be in the same room with them or to even know that they're worshiping the same God as him. This has been in American history. Certain people have not been welcomed in churches. People with different skin colors not been welcomed in the same churches. Now, thankfully, there's always been righteous people, righteous uh, men and women that have stood up against that. But this idea of us and them is so prevalent uh, that, that, you know, Jonah just can't stand the idea. Uh, you know, I know he'd really hate the idea that in the Old Testament and the New, if one of these Ninevites repented, they could become an Israelite. They could be just as much an Israelite as Jonah. And in the same way, you know, Christ has shed his blood for people of every language, nation, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, nationality, ethnicity. And he calls us all brothers and sisters. There's no difference, no division between all those who love the Lord Jesus. So there's not an us and them within Christianity. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, the Bible says. 
But Jonah hates the Assyrians. Um, he hates pretty much all foreigners. And uh, it's just so ungodly. Uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 9, they ask him, I don't know if you noticed this if, you, if you've read the book of Jonah lately, but they, they ask him, in chapter 1, 8, they, they say, tell us, on whose account does this evil come upon us? What is your occupation and from where do you come? What is your country and of what people are you? And so he answers every question except what's your occupation. He will not tell them that he's a prophet. He tells them he's a Hebrew. And he, uh, he tells them that he fears the Lord, the God of heaven. That may or may not be true. But he doesn't tell them that he's a prophet because he just loathes speaking the message. He doesn't, he doesn't want to tell them any more than the bare minimum of what they're asking for. Now, it's possible for us to fall into this mentality. We know the Word of God. We know what God's calling us to do. We know what He's called us to do. And yet, to fall into the idea that it would be better to die than to do this, to do what, what it is that God is calling us. Um, now, I'm not going to get specific with application here, but if you know the Word of God and you know that God's calling you to do something in His Word, um, something that is clearly stated, and you don't want to do that. You hate to do that. Um, you hate, you know, you just just the thought of doing that, whatever that thing is. Uh, it, it seems like it'd be better to die. You know, it could be it could be sharing the gospel with people. I'd rather just die than, than have to share the gospel and be rejected. It just hurts so bad. Then turn to God. Ask Him. To show you his merciful heart. Ask him to remind you who you are. Uh, ask him to remind you uh, of, of how gracious he's been towards you. And ask him to empower you. He's there for you. He's not calling any of us to do any of the things he commands on our own strength. That's what the, that's what the supply of the Spirit is for. But look at how God answers Jonah. It's, it's, it's like a parent answering a child. Jonah is, Jonah is just spewing out this nonsense, really. That, look, God, this is what I told you was going to happen when I was in my own country. Why did you just not, why did you make me do this? And it's better for me to die. Just go ahead and kill me. That's what he's saying. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be angry? It's, it's, it's a deep question, isn't it? So God turns it around and says, Jonah, why don't you think about yourself for a minute? Instead of concerning yourself with my business, whether I'll show mercy on the Ninevites or not. Why don't you think about yourself for a minute? Is it doing you any good to be angry about this? It's a good question. God asks it again at the end of the chapter uh, when the plant dies. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And whatever the plant is in your life, or whatever the, the cause for anger is uh, in your life or in my life, the same question can be asked of us. Is it doing us any good to be angry about this? To be angry? To, to, to let that which God is sovereign over, and of which we have no control, get into our hearts and we can do nothing about it and so we're just going to be angry is that doing any good? God's not going to change because Jonah's angry do you do well to be angry? and, and I think that God asks this question when something good happens and when something bad happens. Something good, meaning that the, when the people repent. Something bad, when the plant dies. He asks it twice, partly to show that as long as Jonah is the center of his own universe, he's never going to be happy whether people are, are repenting and listening to his preaching or whether his plant is dying, whether something good or bad happens. And the same is true for us. If the totality of our world is arranged in our mind around us, with us in the center, we'll never be happy 
We'll never be satisfied in that which is good. Uh, and and, and uh, when something's bad, when something bad happens, we won't learn from it. We we'll just degenerate into this stewing, pouting condition. You know, Jonah was one of the most successful preachers in all of history. The entire city of Nineveh responded to his preaching, and yet he is so self-consumed that he can take no delight in it. He should be so glad about this because it was right to God. But he can't because he's, he's too self-absorbed. He just can't, can't deal with it. And then Jonah is exceedingly glad for the plan. You can see that in, you can see that, uh, uh, in uh, verse 6. He's really glad for the plan. And, and yet he's exceedingly displeased for the salvation of the people. Now, now why, is he, why is he so happy about, uh, about the plant? Well, he's happy about the plant because it benefits him. And, and again, we are, I'm not going to say we can degenerate into this. We are prone to this as people, as, as humans. It's part of our sin nature to only take delight in something that benefits us. And, and so you can see that the Jonah's not glad that the people are repenting. He's not glad about the salvation of God. He's not even glad to know the gracious character of God. He's glad because of a plant. That's what gets him stirred up. Why? Because it benefits him. It's that simple. Uh, and so he's, he's basically using God's creation, and he's saying there's no value in anything God is doing or anything God has made unless it, make, it benefits me. So we come to verse 11. And uh, God has the final word, and we don't really know how Jonah responds. We're never told how Jonah responds. It, it, this book ends rhetorically in an open-ended way to provoke thought. So that, so that we will consider God's question uh, and hopefully draw the right conclusions. So Jonah pities that which is compared to the people. Uh, the plant. It's, it's ignorant uh, like the people. They do, they, the plant just grows and it does what plants and, and, and people do. They, it, just, it just grows and it does what it's, what's natural. Um, and in some ways the plant is like Jonah's own life. He, he didn't work for it. He didn't cause it to grow. Um, he can't cause it to, he can't preserve it, but he expects God's grace towards him. But in, in, many in, in the way that the Bible compares it here, the plant is like the people. Jonah has no investment in the people of Nineveh, but God does. He's given them life and breath and, and, and their being. And he desires to have mercy on them. And that's as simple as it is. Uh, so the main point of this question in verses 10 and 11... He says, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Isn't it interesting he names the cattle? The king puts, it's, it's humorous actually, it's meant to be. The king puts sackcloth on the cattle. You see, these, these, uh, the pagan Ninevites, they didn't know what God wanted. They didn't know how to repent. They probably heard of fasting and sackcloth and ashes, and they had their own ceremonies and so forth. But the king thinks it's a good idea to put sackcloth on the cattle, as though the cattle are going to mourn, right? And so God asks the question, should I not also have mercy on the cattle? And he's comparing the people to the cattle. They don't know the right hand from their left, meaning they don't know what they're doing. They are there without my revelation, except through you, Jonah. Always get that picture of the, 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 the uh, cattle covered in sackcloth walking around the fields. It's kind of must have been an interesting time in in Nineveh. Uh, I wonder if anybody thought that the king was out of his mind for doing that. But the king was desperate for mercy, and when you're desperate for mercy, you'll do just about anything to get it when you really realize how much you need it. Um, but part of the point of this question. And the thing that sort of sort of ought to jump out at us is that, yeah, the cattle don't know what they're doing. The people of Nineveh don't know what they're doing. They don't know the right hand from their left. So who does know? Who does know the right hand from their left? 
who who does know the character of god it's jonah he knows and me and you we know the character of god we have his written revelation Jonah knew the Old Testament. That's how he knew that if the people of Nineveh repented, that God would forgive them. Because Jeremiah 18 says that if at any time a, a nation that is decreed, that is devoted to destruction, that God says he'll destroy. If at any time they repent, God will relent of the destruction and forgive them. And so Jonah knows the Old Testament. He knows the books of, uh, of Moses. Uh, he knows the prophets that went before him. He knows God, or he knows the character of God. And yet, while the people that don't know God are doing the right thing, he knows God and he's doing the wrong thing. And I think that that's a parallel for every Christian that knows the word of God and yet continues to walk in in sin. And so, so you can see that Jonah actually needs more mercy from God than the Ninevites that don't know their right hand from their left. And that sort of reorients the whole scene, doesn't it? Instead of Jonah standing back and, and looking down at them, he can, he, he can actually see himself as, as being in greater need of forgiveness because of his greater knowledge of God. And this is why when, as it's been said... It's a dangerous thing to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Because once you hear it, once you read it, you're responsible for acting upon it. Before, you were in the position of the, uh, of the Ninevites, but now you know. And, you know, so there, there is a great responsibility uh, to being God's people. And so we can see here that, that, that the book of Jonah is not so much about the salvation of a city as it is about God's salvation towards a man, Jonah, towards this prophet. And we hope, as we, as we read this open-ended question, we hope that it dawned upon Jonah uh, before it was all over that he needed more mercy than the Ninevites. Uh, because pretty much every character in the book repents except for Jonah. The Ninevites repent, the sailors repent, even the cattle, if you will, repent. And even God relents. It's the same word, by the way. Repent and relent in Hebrew, the same word. Uh, even God re repents or relents from the destruction. But Jonah just is sitting there on the side of the hill in the obstinance of his own heart. He fears God, but he doesn't love God. He knows about God. He knows about God's character, but he doesn't love God's character. And this is why self-righteousness is so deadly. Because self-righteousness, or thinking much of ourself, um, can turn us and breed a character in us that is ungodly. So verse 11 is certainly a, a, a question for us. Uh, we know God's commandments, we know his character, but do we delight in them? Do we love God? Or do we despise God's character? And so, so um, when I read the book of Jonah, I think, you know, the person or persons that have harmed me the most, and there are people who have done me a lot of harm they repented, if they came to know God, what would my reaction be? Would I be angry at God? Or would I be delighting in the expression of His gracious character towards them? The person or persons that have done you the most harm. And I don't say that lightly. Because I, I know some of you have been very hurt by some pretty wicked deeds that have been done. But if the person that did you the most harm, think about it, if they can't, if they repented, if you see them when you get to heaven, when you stand in the presence of God, and there they are, does that thought bring you joy 
That's the point of Jonah. That's what it's all about. It's to get us to, to think about and pray favorably for those that have harmed us. And to take delight in the, in the thought that God is merciful. He had mercy on me. He can have mercy on them. And I hope he does. Because, when, when, you know, the, if you see your enemy in glory, they're not going to be your enemy anymore. Their nature will, be, will have been transformed, and they will be an emblem of God's grace and mercy and a reflection of His character, just as you will be. But as long as we're thinking about the gourd, we'll miss the merciful heart of God. And we can't really delight in the salvation of the specific people that have hurt us. So, this is why, in part, the Bible says to love your enemy. Now, in, in conclusion, I want to I want to ask this. I, I want to ask: Can somebody as wicked as Jonah be saved? And the answer is, of course, he can. We actually have a lot of evidence to support the idea that Jonah is one of God's children the whole time. He's just in rebellion. Think about it. Think about that character of God and just bring it home to Jonah real, really quick. God is patient with him. God is patient with Jonah. God is gracious towards Jonah. He's disposed to, to do Jonah good. God is merciful towards Jonah personally. Uh, he doesn't destroy him. Even when he argues with God, he doesn't destroy him. Maybe you have, maybe you have sinned in the presence of God, uh, and God has not destroyed you. He's covenantally faithful towards Jonah. Um, his, his love abounds towards him. Uh, you know, he orchestrates all these things: the storm at sea, uh, the the uh, the Ninevites, the plan, everything, and ultimately sends his own son to die for Jonah's sins. Just as he has, has for us. So God loved us so much that he was willing to slay his son for us. Um, even, for, even for the forgiveness of sins that we might hardly acknowledge that we commit. So we can see the, the, the patience, the gracious disposition uh, of God towards us as we see how patient he is with Jonah. He is so patient with this man. So gracious towards him. But as long as you're sitting there under the gourd or hoping the gourd won't wither, uh, you know, just seeing what little things you can get from this life uh, and just waiting for Nineveh to be destroyed, waiting for God to destroy those people or that person that has wronged you so badly, then you'll never be able to delight in God's gracious and merciful character. And you'll miss one of the the greatest joys of life. So God, through reading Jonah, pleads with us to know, not only to know his character, but to embrace our need of his character and to take delight in the gracious, merciful, slow to anger God who is abounding in steadfast love. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray that by your spirit, as we have looked into the book of Jonah, that you have indeed shown us, as in a mirror, our hearts. And Lord, I, I pray that we would find our hearts soft and merciful, uh, mercifully inclined, even towards those who have hurt us, even towards those who sin greatly against you. Lord, our desire is that is that others would be saved and would come to know the God who has had such abundant mercy upon us and who loves us. We pray, O oh God, that you would make it so in our hearts. Purify us from any bitterness, from any reluctance to see others saved. Lord, help us to have the same kind of attitude that the angels in heaven have, rejoicing in the salvation of sinners. We thank you in Jesus' name.